Cool. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming along, everybody. This is the um, ESIP Information Technology and Interoperability um, Standing Seminar Webinar um, Meeting. Uh, we're a co um, kind of a co sponsored group with ESIP and the USGS Community for Data Integration. Um, my name is Dave Blodgett. I kind of coordinate the, the schedule and um, in introduce the talks, and um, that's about it. So, um, with that, uh, I've been really looking forward to hearing about um, the transition that ESIP has been going through over the last little while with their web infrastructure. Um, and Allison Mills has uh, graciously volunteered to come and tell us about it. Um, so I will leave it there. Allison, I'll let you introduce yourself um, and take us away. I'm happy to happy to have you take as much of the hour as you want. So thanks for thanks for doing it. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'll get my slides popped up first. So, hey everyone, I am Allison Mills. I am the communications director here at ESIP. And many of you probably already know and love ESIP. We are one of the co-hosts um, of this monthly IT and I call with Dave and the USGS uh, community for data integration, CDI. And we're gonna dig into the IT side of things today. So normally like I will nerd out about social media, news writing, uh, science communication, but we're actually gonna dig into like the digital platforms behind a lot of the, the communications work that I do and then um, the digital platforms behind how our collaboration works here at ESIP. Um, so we're gonna talk about like our website, our DNS records, um, our various meeting tools. And your first reaction may be like, uh, why? <laughs> and, and I just want to clarify, it's because ESIP as a virtual community, um, that, that means that all of our collaborations are primarily digital in itself. So it's really like information technology. It's about being able to use computer systems to talk to each other, like literally talk to not just these systems, but talk to one another as human beings. And so um, all of our collaborations really depend on the integrity of our IT infrastructure, which has been going through some evolutions behind the scenes. So we're gonna take an even bigger step back and we're gonna talk about why ESIP is a remote community in the first place. So we are uh, a nonprofit. Um, we were founded in 1998 and our community um, of earth science data and computing professionals have evolved alongside the geospatial and the EOTech that um, really drove like the initial like interdisciplinary need that brought us all together. So like our, our community and the technology have like evolved alongside one another. And as a part of that evolution, our organization's mission and vision has been reworked. So last year, the board approved uh, this new vision right here. Uh, and it is a world where data-driven solutions are a reality for all by making earth science data actionable but by all who need them anytime, anywhere. Uh, that's kind of big. <laughs> and our mission is as well. So our mission is to, excuse me, empower the use and stewardship of earth science data to solve our planet's greatest challenges. I mean, planet's greatest challenges. Like we're not we're not setting our sights on like a very small action, right? So we're driven by some pretty big ideas and no one explains why we do this better than our community. So I'm going to share a short video with you. This is from our 25th anniversary last year and it mixes different community voices into a single, a single message that really speaks to this mission. Welcome to Earth Science Information Partners. Just ESIP. ESIP is a place to collaborate, to collaborate and innovate. Place to connect and learn. ESIP is a place to teach and learn, but also to create innovative solutions to address community challenges. ESIP is a place to, to get things done. 
Aesop is vibrant. Welcoming. Awesome. Aesop is like family. Aesop is community. Aesop is, is a community. Aesop is a community. That's core to Aesop's values, which are integrity, integrity inclusiveness, inclusiveness, collaboration, collaboration openness, openness, and curiosity. curiosity. I'm Susan Shingledecker, Aesop's executive director. As an organization, we envision a world where data-driven solutions are a reality for all by making earth science data actionable by all who need them, anytime, anywhere. ESIP empowers innovative use and stewardship of earth science data to solve our planet's greatest challenges. And we celebrate our 25th anniversary this year. Here's what our community sees for the next 25 years of ESIP. In 25 years, ESIP will be, the be a world community leader in data innovation, earth science information, and how we access earth science data in open science. In 25 years, ESIP, ESIP will make the data to action pathway seamless. ESIP will help lead the world through its greatest environmental challenges. ESIP will be looked upon as a place to, is a place, place to connect, as a place to gather with like-minded people from diverse backgrounds. Place for um, it's a place for like data nerds to come together. Will revolutionize the way we access and use Earth science data. We would like to so. So I love that video, and I will also be the first person to say like, but what exactly does ESIP do? Um, that's like the that's my job security right there is explaining that statement. So um, when it, when we dig into like what ESIP does, it's this play between the tension of these very big picture mission and vision, and then connecting it to some of the individual work and some of those individual voices that you heard in the video. And so this um, brings us back to kind of our IT tools and the collaboration tools that we use to then make some of that connection and kind of play into the, the inherent tension between big scale and small scale work. So we have a lot of collaboration tools. We have many, many, um, but we're just gonna briefly dig into three of them today. And before we do that, um, and before we get into kind of like the day-to-day -day grind of what it takes to uh, maintain some of these virtual collaborations, I would really love to hear from you all. So if you pop open your, uh, your chat, we're gonna do a handful of chat prompts today. I would love to hear from you what, what tools you use. And I'm actually gonna make sure that I can get my chat bar opened up on the side. Hopefully that doesn't create a funny shadow, but I definitely wanna make sure that I can see you all. Um, Shree for Dave, can you let me know if that creates a funny shadow on my screen? No, nope, looks fine. Okay, awesome. Well, cool. So go ahead, I would love to pop into the chat. Like, what do you use? Obviously we're all on Zoom. <laughs> yes, thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, what what else do you use? Are you on Slido? Do you like Sked? Are you uh, a diehard go-to meeting person? Um, do you use a wiki? Like what, what do you, yep, so I see some Teams, Blue Sky, yes, Fostodon. Anybody still on Twitter or X? I do have a shout out to that later later in the talk. Yes, GitLab, GitHub, those are really important ones to ESIP, along with Figshare. Um, we're grandfathered into a pretty sweet uh, repository set up there. Drive, yes, I know all of us. I would, I would keel over if my Google Drive <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> Great, yes, Sonoto, Teams, lots of Teams. Email, yes kind of like the best of IT right there. <laughs> We're also gonna like do a little shout out to some email issues as well. RSS, yeah, okay, cool. So clearly like we all have a lot of different tools that we can and do use. So for us um, in ESIP, along with our new mission and vision, one of the things that we did was also roll out a refined set of our core values. And so I'm going to speak to a couple of them today. And I'm going to start with the one that I think is most relevant for our conversation today, and that is collaboration. Um, if you want to dig into these, you're welcome to find them on our about page. And um, 
I use them today specifically so that we can again make this connection between like the everyday day to day stuff of like the platforms that we're using, but continuously tying it back into the bigger strategy of an organization. So collaboration, it does indeed need a front door and a welcome mat. And in the digital ecosystem, that specifically means we need a website. And we just refreshed ours, like less than a month ago, we rolled out our beautiful, awesome, fully functional uh, esipfed.org. Um, it was an 18 month intensive process uh, before that. And I think it was my, yeah, it was my third day after I had started at ESIP in fall 2021, um, that the site started malfunctioning so badly that we couldn't make updates to it for three months. And so I learned a ton about um, all of like the ins and outs of WordPress and style sheets and DNS issues, hard-coded HTML that causes like all of the code to start to break, uh, cookies, GDPR, all of it. And I say that to you all so that you can hopefully understand my front door metaphor a little bit more. It doesn't matter how nice your welcome mat is if the deck underneath it has termites and it's falling apart. So our termites are now gone um, and we've rebuilt the deck and have better access to our ESIP house through our front door, which is our website. And one of the digital spaces that I'm particularly proud of is our, our collaboration areas page. So that's what this big QR code um, goes to. And to most folks, it doesn't look any different than the old one, but behind the scenes is where the magic really is. So in our content management system, our CMS, uh, every one of the squares that you can see on this website, so it's like air quality and ag and climate in each group, um, every single one of those squares represents a tiny ESIP microcosm. It's kind of like they're all of the doors inside of our little ESIP house. And each one then links to an individual page that is automatically pulled into several modules that we that shuffle through on several pages on our website. It's neat. I'm very happy about it. Um, but those pages alone, even though they represent our community, they don't really make up our community. So we also use a handful of other tools in service to collaboration. So here are some of the main ones, um, obviously our website, Slack, uh, the ESIP update, which we use MailChimp um, and integrates neatly with our website and several other platforms. And then our partner directory and we use MC Trade um, to develop that. But there are some sticking points. <laughs> so as we clean up and take out some of the friction in our IT platforms, it's a blessing and a curse. And here's why. The work of creating, maintaining, and sharing all of this work and maintaining these systems um, can be thankless and at the very least unseen. So this is a challenge that many nonprofits face. Um, technology and its human dimensions can be a challenge. Um, part of our team, uh, we were really lucky. We got to go to the nonprofit technology conference last, uh, just last month in Portland. And again and again, this like tension between IT and service, the IT and service juggle um, came up. So, um, but enough about us. What does this mean for you? So when you're thinking about communities of practice and what, what, where to start, and what to do, um, the very first thing that you can do is look at your website. So who, who is coming to your website and what story are they getting from that like first impression? Um, moving on, we also need to talk about the elephant in the room. I alluded to it on this slide, but we're gonna talk about funding and some of its influence as well. So money, money, money. I would love to have everybody pop into the chat. Where does your funding come from? Either specifically to do some of like your IT work and some of the maintaining of this, whether that's funding for collaboration, funding for learning. Um, we're just gonna talk about where the money comes in. Kind of a money is like one way to measure like authority and power in a way. And so who, who gets to make the decisions in your community? And this might be grant funding. Um, you might have 
uh, a budget that varies depending on a whole bunch of different factors. Yes, appropriation, state agencies, Congress. Yep, Congress. <laughs> I figured we'd have a lot of like federal folks on here. Yes, yep. And so ESIP, um, we're kind of unique. We are, um, unlike many nonprofits that are usually funded by individual donors, ESIP is, uh, we have multi-year cooperative agreements in place with uh, NASA, NOAA, and the USGS. And Dave, um, I love the note about uh, your inner taxpayer. <laughs> that's, a, that's nice. Um, so we're kind of unique in our situation with ESIP. And one of the best things about this cooperative agreement model is that especially as a nonprofit, it brings us a lot more stability than some nonprofits see. Um, and it also brings a lot of clarity around like the scope of our work. The challenge is that we need to have a crystal ball when it comes to like setting budgets so far in advance, especially when we're working with federal agencies that, you know, are kind of at the whims of a lot of the groups that you all have mentioned in, in chat here. So one of the areas that we try to maintain a lot of flexibility with in, in both our collaborative tech platforms and how it's funded is in the microfunding that we do through the ESIP lab. And so this is one of the ways that we make sure that we are encouraging innovation and learning. So each year we release an RFP through the ESIP lab. The projects are small, but they have one big piece. Um, we build in time and funding for learning objectives. It's very cool. I could totally spend the rest of the hour talking about how awesome this is and give a big shout out to Annie Burgess, our ESIP lab director. Um, but we got a lot of other platforms to explore as well. So you're welcome to head over to the ESIP lab. Um, that's the QR code here on this page. And we're going to talk specifically about some of the behind the scenes platforms, again, that support, you know, this kind of unique funding model and the collaboration um, that then supports the community of practice in this way. So again, we've got our website. Um, that's our front door, even for the lab. Uh, we've got GitHub, Figshare, and then I talked a little bit about MC Trade. So of course, there are challenges. Uh, and for these ones in particular, uh, I don't think that any of these are surprising. Time and money are, you know, basically what most sticking points boil down to, especially in our professional lives. Um, but for us, it really is a reminder to be mindful and to hold back um, from pushing projects at a breakneck pace. Because if we don't provide funding that makes time for learning and makes time for working on new technical skills to connect to other people, then that stuff will always fall by the wayside. So it's one of the reasons that learning objectives is one of the key components and one of the key ways that we decide whether or not to fund an ESIP lab project. So this is simply an invitation um, for you to reflect in your community building, especially for those of you like ESIP that gather around technical challenges, we need time to learn. And so since time is money, we have to think about how to carve out the resources to encourage curiosity and innovation. So where do you do that in your budgeting process? One way that we do that at ESIP um, certainly carving out time for learning, um, as well as feeding into our funding model, is our ESIP meeting. Uh, we have a virtual one in uh, a virtual one in January, and then we do an in-person hybrid one every July. So I would love to hear from you all. What conferences do you attend? And, you know, which ones do you go to that you love? And what are some of the things that you actively avoid when you start thinking about conferences? And shout outs to anybody who has already registered for our ESIP meeting that's coming up in Asheville, North Carolina. We did our site visit as a team in September, and I'm very, very excited for it. Yes, I hear you. I hear you, Mike. ESIP times two. <laughs> oh, I love the weird ones. AAG. Yeah. And what are some other ones? Anybody attend? Is anybody attending EGU in this next 
week we will have a we will have a um, data help desk, an open science and data help desk. Ooh, Geo for good. I haven't heard of that one. I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, so keep keep rolling the, the comments on in. Um, for us, meetings matter. Um, our, our nonprofit is really built around being able to host these two these two meetings that we that we support. So we we also host a, a handful of smaller meetings um, for our federal agency sponsors. And we're so we're kind of like always in meeting mode um, between the planning and um, you know just getting all of the logistics sorted out and then actually you know being present and running the registration desk and all of that uh, and tech support especially for for virtual meetings. So you can check out our meeting. This is the QR code, and then we're going to dig into some of the behind the scenes platforms that we use. Um, again, website is the front door for this collaboration. So that's like the space where our community can come to and learn about it. But then we need like more tools to actually dig into like what's going on. Um, we host our agenda on Sketch. We use Eventbrite for registration, which is also very neat because it uh, dovetails with our community calendar plugin that we use on our WordPress site. And it also dovetails and is actually embedded inside of our Sketch site as well. And then for actually running the, the Zoom rooms and keeping those links safe, we use Kiko Chat and Zoom. And then we are Google Doc monsters <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to uh, the meeting. So if you check out that link down there, then you'll be able to kind of see how we run some of that. And we've seen a lot of like behind the scenes and how people organize. And some people are spreadsheet monsters, some people are doc monsters. I swear to goodness, I have seen other people who somehow plan entire meetings with 200 people on sheets of paper and it is mind boggling, but we all have our different pieces of technology that enable us to work together and collaborate. So some of the sticking points, again, these aren't necessarily surprising. Uh, time and money will always be there, but there's an extra layer, especially with virtual meetings and collaborations that we have to consider. And that's this tension between cybersecurity and wanting easily accessible meetings. So I hate to tell you, but Zoom bombing is still a thing and we have to think mindfully of it. And what does this mean for you? So tally it up, right? This is like an old school IT like starting point is like if you're if you're not quite sure what to do or where to go, um, how to move forward, you first have to start with an inventory. So if you are in the process of doing an event, even if it is just for a couple dozen people, it is worth sitting down, thinking through the tools that you're using, and then streamlining or maximizing um, to the best of your ability. So I am. I'm curious, folks, um, what tools and processes um, have been either new to you today or um, that you want to learn more about? I'm either, I, I could nerd out about all of the tools that I mentioned here, but I was going to try to be relatively, relatively expedient <laughs> going through, going through them. So what are tools that you're excited about, tools that you're working with? or even a behind the scenes process, like how many of you work on CMS? How many of you have had to set up Sketch before? Or do you, are you lucky you just get to tell people what to put in Sketch? Well, you can keep thinking about that one for a little bit. Um, oh, the CMS topic, yes, Dave, we will, we will circle back. To the CMS. I could give everybody like a, a tour when we're done with the slides. I could show you kind of the behind the scenes process that we've got for, for our WordPress site now. Um, all right. Yes. Yes, I agree, Madison. With all of these tools, it is definitely an evolving experience and something that we are constantly readjusting and, and learning and refining. And of course, all of these tools are evolving. So it's never, it's never like you get a static set of information about any of them. So not everything is sunshine and rainbows. Like I'm very proud of our new website. I am 
so impressed with everything that our our 25 year old five person staff like a uh, small but mighty team at ESIP can do. But the reality is, is that because we've got a small team and because we've got a very like DIY tech savvy crowd that we work with, we have accumulated a lot of tech debt over the last 25 years. So we're gonna talk about some of those specific issues. So the first one, emails suck. <laughs> like they're both like amazing and wonderful. And I like sometimes reflect on how they've connected us around the globe. And at the same time, we like really take emails for granted. And so when they don't work and your emails bounce or something else happens, um, it's really problematic. We really take this IT platform for granted. And so the, the solution for us, we don't have IT staff. Um, there's me and there's Annie. <laughs> and so neither one of us are trained IT professionals, but we have had to go into our DNS records and there's like new DMAR policies that need to be out there. So just a quick summary in case nobody else follows the news around this. Um, Google and Yahoo changed their requirements for DMARC policies and our DNS records because they kind of serve as like a, basically like a phone book for the internet. Um, there are specific files, these records that prove that your domain is legit. And so the DMARC policies are a way for these entities, all of these email entities to vet whether or not an email is good or not. Um, for orcs with full-time staff, sure, they like have been able to deal with this because they're like, like in the weeds all day, every day. Um, but at ESIT, because we don't have IT staff, we have been really scrappy and we've started to work with a couple of different web developers and it's, it's a lot of work. And, and Mike, like I, I, your point about this influencing Substack, it has influenced anybody who uses email and it's just whether or not you're aware, like if you're IT, like if you talk to somebody in IT, they will definitely talk to you about the, the intensity of DMARC issues right now. So that's one issue that we're really facing. The other one is Twitter is no X. Um, and I'll, I'll say really about this one is that the gray zone between communications and IT can get pretty blurry sometimes. Um, and especially with social media and these third party platforms, which we use a lot in ESIP, um, problems with them like raise everyone's blood pressure and we've created such complex digital ecosystems that in order to quickly and like succinctly connect and share information um we we just had to embrace a lot of complexity so it's going to be fascinating to watch some of these social spaces um, evolve. What we've decided to do in ESIP, um, we assessed our social media metrics. I've been gathering them since I started at ESIP in 2021. And I really ended up just deciding to focus on the platforms where we were seeing higher levels of engagement um, and to go where the people are. Like if it is a quote unquote social space, we want to be capital S social lowercase m media. And so that's kind of to me like one of those fun blurry spaces between communications and IT, although definitely um, raises my blood pressure. Along with this one, uh, our old Wikimedia pages through ESIP um, are old. We started the, the wiki in what, like, like the early 2000s. Um, and some of those pages are still around. So one of the things that we're going to be working on is creating new web pages and processes to replace and like get all of the content from our collaboration areas updated and to modernize all of it and do so in a way that still serves the community. That it's not just about like making ESIP look pretty, although I would like it if the wiki stopped showing up higher in search engine uh, algorithms than all of our main uh, ESIP web pages. That would be a nice benefit. But really, this is again about communities of practice and how we bring people together. And so, when we're looking at streamlining or changing some of these uh, these digital tools, the question is really about like how does it serve the people who are using them? All right. So this is another one that we deal with. Um, and I don't, I don't actually think that this one's like super. It's not, it's not really bad, right? Um, especially for some of our ESIP volunteers, probably many of you on this call, 
who can't, who you're not allowed to use things like Slack or, uh, you know, maybe certain domains are not whitelisted in your IT department. And so you'll, you're never going to receive a certain email. And that's, that's, you know, kind of tying back to some of those DNS record issues. Um, but for us, this problem is actually a really, it has a really lovely solution that again, embraces a little bit more complexity. So we, we've committed to doing the extra work behind the scenes in order to let our community self-design with configurable tools. The challenge is that that makes it so that we have like kind of too many options, but it matters to us and it matters to our community. And so we make sure that we can adapt to every single collaboration area and every group and every partner that we work with. And that again, goes back to budgeting time and energy to do so. So just one more uh, chat prompt here. Um, I want to hear more about like some of the tech debt issues or the barriers that you're working on or that you observed in the broader world. Like Mike had brought up some of the, the Substack things or, um, you know, some of like the, the ad hoc Git based authoring. I'm sure that that definitely can come with some challenges. Like what are, what are some of the issues that you all are facing, especially as you're trying to work within either as a participant or if you're actually managing um, and helping build communities of practice. Also, if you have general like Q&A questions at this point, we can, I welcome some of those too. I do remember that there was a, the question about the CMS from earlier. Yes, I agree, Dave. Migration of legacy content, uh, data or otherwise, um, stands out as a very hard problem. That that there might be like that is the heart of the problem that we have um, with both the wiki and with things like the ESIP Commons. Yes. Oh, yes. Organizing years of documents. Our our drive is in a similar a similar space. Oh, interesting, Mike. Yeah, oh, lots of really great comments coming through. Yeah, we can dig into some of these. Yeah, obsolete info, yeah. So in the communications world, so this is another one of those blurry IT communications things. We talk a lot about EAT, which is, uh, let's see, expertise, expertise, authority, and trust. There we go, I got that right. And the new one that they've recently added, especially with how AI is particularly influencing search right now, um, is experience. And so we're literally adding like a subjective element into what we might call that like, like single source truth, right? It just like really gets at like the complexity of all of this. Yeah, and control, you know, something isn't on our network. Yeah, all of these things. You all are having, this is a fantastic discussion here. <laughs> um, yes, authentic authentication requirements for sure. That's even something we face with like our Zoom calls. You know, we right now don't require people to register in order to enter, but it does mean that, you know, we have to find more creative ways to protect our Zoom links. Yeah. Well, this is exciting. Well, how about, um, I'm going to switch my screen share really quick and we can get into, oh, well, it's going to, I'll switch that in a second, but um, maybe if, Sharif or Dave, if either of you, as I get, uh, I'm going to get the CMS pulled up for the ESIP website. If either of you want to add anything or go over some of the questions or thoughts that came up in the chat, then I can get, get our login. I get the login page all 
prepped. So the themes that I'm seeing from folks are um, something, I guess, something you talked about that I'd be really curious to hear more about is this idea of who who's the steward of the um, the shared resource, um, and and how how do you have advocacy for a shared resource that, as an organization, especially a community organization, you kind of want to govern at a high level, but it's also kind of stuff that people want to take for granted and don't want to think about. <laughs> I think that's one 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 area, and then like content um, content modernization and like how you how you reckon with that? Like there's content from people 10, 15 years ago that you don't feel at liberty to get rid of, but maybe it just needs to get deleted. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, and then the other one is the user management The like, um, you talked a couple times about the system that you use for tracking stat the, the people basically. Um, and I'd be curious to hear a little more about, about that. Yeah, yeah. So let's dig in that first one because I I think that it like brings up like information technology and like almost like it's kind of the separation of the two, right? Like we love it when they work seamlessly together and those platforms are fully integrated. Um, but in reality, like we end up kind of having these weird pockets where information lives and it's accessible but it doesn't get updated because it's like the human processes behind the technology platform that just makes it very very widely available um and we started doing so with groups where we have either helped develop or we offer some sort of support so an example would be like um so the commons was one um copdes is another uh core let's see i'm forgetting a Oh, the data management clearinghouse. That was the, the training clearinghouse. So with all of those, we actually started to put, we called them MOIs. Uh, and this is a memorandum of um, information. And it was just a way to at least like on the, the ESIP side to have a record that had a date and that had all of the links and had like who's in charge of the domain name, where that lives, who is hosting what, um, because we just, we didn't have records of any of that. And suddenly, like, uh, this is about a year and a half ago, like the Copta site just like went down one day <laughs> and like none of us knew what to do because some of us had some login information and other people didn't. And so we just tried to like get into the spirit of documentation, right? And it doesn't have to be a lot, but as long as it is dated and it is saved in a human readable format, then it at least gives you a starting point. And I think that like kind of gets into some of like the, the user issues as well. Like we, sometimes I think we put our technology first. And if instead as a community, you have a really clear set of values and that is what informs your decision-making, then it kind of helps you clear out the noise so that when you make decisions about who has access to this, how do we get them access, what content is no longer serving us and we need to archive, then you make those decisions based on something that the group has agreed on together um, rather than one person randomly making a decision and then a lot of like important data and a lot of important information kind of goes by the wayside. And this is particularly sticky in community spaces, right? Do we need everybody's brainstorm document that has been that has been created in Google Drive since 2017? I don't know. <laughs> that's a good question. We struggle with that because that's what our wiki is. Um, that's what our Google Drive is. And so maybe I don't have any answers. Maybe I can just tell everyone that I feel you. I feel I see your the struggle. And I think the the one space that I have found more more answers has been in the nonprofit technology uh, community, and that's been really wonderful. So if anybody wants some of those resources, I'm happy happy to share. Does that get at what you were summarizing, Dave? Yeah, I think so. Um, if you're going to demo, I guess if you're going to demo stuff. <laughs> be curious to see the the kind of CMS side of things and and 
I'm very curious about how you guys are handling all the tracking of people. Um, and mm, I wonder if I could pull that up too. Yeah, we'll we'll see. You mentioned, I, have... I, I, I forget the acronym now, but you mentioned a, a technology you're using for the directory of people. Yes, that's our CRM. So our, uh, technically that's like a client relationship management platform. Um, we use one that I loathe called MC Trade. I will, I own my dislike of it proudly. Um, CRMs can be really tricky because most of them are very hyper-specialized and ESIP is unique. And so it's hard to track things like whether or not people are showing up to calls like this, whether or not they're engaged in the community. Um, most of these platforms are set up to track money. And so again, it kind of like comes back to like whatever your community shared values are, that's kind of what you want to build your tools around. But sometimes those tools don't exist. Okay, but enough chit chat. Let's actually look at, let's look at our website. So this is, I don't know if it will let me resize my, I still want to be able to see you all. Um, now you've all disappeared. Hmm. Let me stop sharing for just a second. Sorry, my Zoom is, be Zoom is being very grouchy today. I apologize, folks. Okay, I'm just not going to mess with things. Okay, so this is our new website. It's very lovely. This is our homepage. We completely reworked this entire menu here. We had to sort out a lot of parent-child relationships. And the page that I had been mentioning that I was particularly excited about is this collaboration areas page. And so this is what links to our community calendar, which has significantly more functionality than it used to. And then underneath all of here, we now have a searchable list of collaboration areas. And then every single one of these pages, you can either go to the mailing list that um, is connected to it, or some of them, I've actually gone ahead and created some of the pages. So each one of these then has its own individual page. It lets you know if it's active, there's a quick summary of what they do. And then everything, it lets you know who the, the chairs are. And then everything links back to, um, in this case, they store all of their information on their wiki. Some people do that in a running notes, Google doc. Um, some people have Slack, some people don't. And that's like where that configurable tools element is. So this is where some of that configuration lives, but it looks and functions the same across every group, which is kind of cool. So we'll head back to all of the collaboration areas because, uh, and actually back to the homepage, because one of the spaces that I was really excited about having this show up is at the bottom of our web page. We've then got all of these little, so you can see they're kind of starting to, to sort through and shuffle through. And so this is a way that we can actually start to highlight some of the work because that's also some of the information that was getting siloed in our community was that like nobody, nobody had an opportunity to learn what other people were doing unless someone made a lot of effort to go through and write a blog or to, you know, um, share an output or get an endorsement and all of those things. We still want to celebrate all of those things, but there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and a work in progress is still really valuable. Knowledge sharing between people is still really valuable. And so we wanted to be able to showcase that in a fair way on the website. And what this looks like behind the scenes. So if you're familiar with WordPress, this is the basic dashboard. Um, Everything that you pretty much find is along here on the side. This is connected to our events calendar so that I have a lot more control than I used to. We used to just create like a Google calendar invite and now, now there's way more functionality on here, which is neat. And under all of these pages, that's what controls most of our pages. But then we have this separate collaboration area module. And this is where we can start to keep track of like every single group that has ever existed in ESIP can still have like the science software hasn't been around in ESIP for a while, but through the collaboration areas module that we have, it's now a space where we can actually keep track of some of that information and have it more clearly marked when things are archived or on hiatus or whatever. So, um, most of these are some of the the ones that have been on hiatus or like in the example clean they're now an ESIP partner but i wanted to show yes here's the one 
So the public-private partnership cluster is one of the groups that I originally made a page for. So right up at the top, I can mark if they're active, inactive, I can build custom pages for them right here, which then I can put in all of this short description. And this like automatically pulls into like the rest of the ESIP website. So like if anybody like hovers over one of those folders, if you click on one of those folders, it will take you to one of these pages. And then we've got, you know, all of the information. Um, we've just put it into past tense for groups that are on hiatus or if they're active, like the CDF one that I shared. Um, and then again, this is like some of that configurable um, buttons that we can pop into here. And what I love with our new, uh, if, if I'm going to, well, you guys are going to be messing around the CMS. I don't have to do this as an actual training, but what I love about our CMS is like how much more streamlined this is. It used to be that if I opened this up, it was every single option that WordPress offers every single one. There were literally millions of options that I had every single time I signed in to create new content. And now we've got it changed so that when I go to, um, let's go ahead and add a new one, I can create just a few. They're just a few little options. And if I, if I go into another, like add a content row, add, you know, specific pieces, I now have specific rows, specific modules um, that limit really like the layout itself. So that's part of what helps us create, you know, what we would say like as a brand identity, but really what we're talking about is a community identity so that you see something and you recognize that it's a part of ESIP, that you don't have to guess and you don't have to read more to, to decide and figure out, am, am I in the right place? Am I still on the website? Um, we have taken away that that muddiness that is now that is now much clearer. All right, so Dave, is there more that you wanted from the the CMS? No, that's great. It's really good to see. Yeah, I wish I could show you how like goofy the old one was. Like, I literally had to set. I had to do the HTML to say like, I want heading two to be a size thirty two font in font family, whatever. I am trained as a science writer. I am not trained as a web developer. So this this is a much improved space. And I hope that it means that we get to do more in service to our community because we won't be doing so much behind the scenes on the website. Mm -hmm. So we've got 10 minutes. Um, it's, I guess I'd like to open the floor to anybody else that wants to ask questions or if there's any other demos, things you're curious to see. Yeah, I've got all the staff login. So do you want to see how Sketch works behind the scenes? Do you want to see Eventbrite? I can, I'm happy to give a behind the scenes look at any of our collaboration platforms. Fair question, Mike. Um, Kiko Chat is really, it was the, the most configurable way to be able to preserve all of our Zoom links. So I should back up for a second. So Kiko Chat is a platform that we use at our ESIT meetings. It is the space that people have to log into in order to go to different Zoom rooms. Um, and the number one reason we use it is for cybersecurity. It means that people can't access the Zoom links who aren't supposed to be there. So it prevents Zoom bombing and other issues um, during our meetings. The downside is that it requires yet one more platform that somebody has to sign into in order to attend the meeting. Um, how, unless others have, have things, I'll throw another question out there. How, um, how much are you experiencing friction or issues that are coming up with a lack of integration between these platforms, like, especially for people that need to exist across multiple, like you've got Zoom, Google, and Kigo all in the same context with user authentication and all that, like, is, is, 
are there good solutions for that? Are there those major points of friction? I guess how does that how does that all work? There's maybe less friction than people may think. I can't remember. There's a funny um, marketing and tech term for this. It's like basically like how complicated a, a consumer is willing to let a piece of technology be. It's like a tolerance level. And so like we're constantly trying to figure out like what is people's tolerance levels for when something is too complex or too annoying to bother to bother following through. And we even see that with clicks. Like if I think the the current stat for for like web writing and for best practices for leading practices for web design is like if somebody has to click more than twice, they're they're never going to find that page. Um, so there's some friction, but it's kind of a weird subconscious friction. And so it maybe comes up in conversations like right now, but how many of us are willing to like, oh, fine, I have to go like log in again. Oh, I forgot my password. I have to go get my password manager and here's my face. And like, we're all starting to get used to that. And we could argue whether or not that's a good thing and whether that's a thing that we want. If anybody else has solutions on that front, I want to I want to hear them because we are definitely constantly doing the the platform juggle. Yeah, I'm. I, I, yeah, I'm. I'm numb to that as well. I, I, I'm not. I'm not so sure. I'm used to it. Every once in a while, every once in a while, you have to do a double take. You're like, why am I clicking on pictures of motorcycles? God. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely, I definitely understand that feeling. And that's like when I, what I said earlier in the talk, like we expect our IT systems to have as little friction as possible, but we, we, it's more like a stream, right? You get used to being in the flow of the stream. And so when there's, you know, more turbulence or you start to hit a rockier patch, like it's not like you suddenly go from like the bottom of a pool and then you're in like a mountain stream. Like there's little things that usually start to transition over time. So we end up tolerating a lot more, um, a lot more movement than we would have. I mean, could you imagine in like 1985, like people doing what we do now to like sign in and like, <laughs> Yeah, use use my face to open my password vault, search for search for the web page, copy and paste it using three clicks yeah. each. Yeah, no, it's pretty bonkers actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and it's, it's like suggest on. a super secure one, and then you forget that it's in a space that you now have to type it out, and so it takes you three minutes to. <laughs> yes, definitely pain point. Yeah, and I um. So we're we're up against time here. I really appreciate um, really appreciate the tour. Um, Madison, yes, you know I always get it wrong. Like I don't know if there's traffic lights in that one. Let's try the next one. Anyways, um, so I took some notes, minutes, kind of thing. Um, we'll have the recording. Um, I'll probably try to capture all the links that you had. I think I got most of them in the minutes anyways. Um, and yeah, do you have any any final comments? No, just I appreciate the opportunity to nerd out about websites and DNS records and all that good stuff with you all. It's stuff that I learned at ESIP. <laughs> nice. We are all generalizing specialists or specializing yes. generalists, depending where you start. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, um, I don't have anything specific for next month yet. I will get some someone. I've got a few ideas. Uh, I'm going to ask around um, and we'll get a nice, a nice talk for next month. Um, so stay tuned. And other than that, um, I'd say have have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thank you, Thank you much. Take care. Bye.